stay with us as we sing his praises as well. Uh, Dr. Schultz is in the house. 
and uh, this is his first year as our theology associate professor of theology and editor of Baptist University Press. Before he came to the Baptist University of Florida, he was the senior pastor at the First Baptist Church in Tallahassee for the last six years. Before that, he served in Missouri as pastor there. He has a bachelor's degree and two master's degrees from the Baptist Bible Theological Seminary and Bible College, and then he earned his Ph.D. in Systematic Theology from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's married to his wife, Kristen, for 21 years, and they have three daughters. And so, Dr. Schultz, we are delighted the Lord led you to the Baptist University of Florida and are excited to hear you preach today. So let's pray together. Father, we praise you today. We we join with all of creation, and, and may all that have breath today praise the Lord. We thank you that you're the God of creation. You're the God of salvation. And one day you're coming again, and you're going to make all things new, Lord. And we'll live forever in a new heavens and a new earth and that new Jerusalem. And we glory in that today. Pray, Lord, for these who are lost without a witness, without a missionary, many of them, unengaged in South Asia. I pray that someone would care for their soul. Lord, that you'd raise up people from among us even who would go. And we pray next week you'd call out the call. Pour out your spirit among us today as Dr. Schultz preached. And we'll give you the glory and the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
God. Stole him. We marvel at his glory, his majesty. We look upon him and we behold him. across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of
look upon your majesty, Lord, we just marvel. Lord, that we would be able to worship you, that you would let us come into your presence, Lord, to sing these things, that you are worthy, that you are holy. Father, Lord, I pray that as we continue our day today, Lord, that we continue to be in awe, with awe and reverence, Lord, for who you are. We love you so much, Lord. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. We'll see you tomorrow. So excited about what God is doing here at Buff and in this time right now, how he's at work. We're going to be in the Word together in James chapter 1. So if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. As you're turning there, I want you to consider how the Apostle Paul is on his missionary journey. He's traveling throughout Greece. He's ministering to brand new churches as the gospel has spread. You talk about another exciting time in the history of God's people. God is doing an amazing work. He gets to the city of Troas. He's never been there before. He's only going to be there for a week because he has his heart set on getting to Jerusalem. The, the Lord's Day, Sunday, second last day that he's going to be there. He's going to leave in the morning. And so you can just imagine the excitement among that brand new church. Everyone's going to make every effort to be there. After all, it's the Apostle Paul, and this might be the only time we're ever going to get to hear him, see him, meet him. As you imagine church in those days, it's a little different than how we experience church now. Sunday was a work day. There's no such thing as the weekend. And so they would work all day, and then they would come together for a service that night. And because it's a brand new church, they don't have some building in town. They're meeting in someone's home. And they would gather together. They would eat a meal. They would take the Lord's Supper. They would, would visit. They would sing. They would pray. They would hear preaching. It's just an amazing time. And because it's the Apostle Paul... If you were a believer in Troas, you're going to be there. And so they all get together, and that home is packed. Now, we know that Paul is an experienced communicator. I mean, we have some of his messages in Scripture, and he certainly knew one of the most important truths about public speaking, that the mind can only take what the seat can endure. We know that. But I love the way that Luke puts it. Paul, he, he had to have just gotten excited. It's the only time I'm going to be with these believers. I, we, we've got all night. I'm leaving first thing in the morning. And Luke says he prolonged his message until midnight. And now you can just see the torches in that third floor of that home they were meeting in starting to flicker. And everyone is packed in, and everyone's been working, and everyone's tired, and someone over here yawns. And what happens when somebody over here yawns? Somebody over here yawns. And that starts to spread. There's a young man named Eutychus, who, because the room is so packed, doesn't have a seat. He's sitting on a windowsill. And it just had to get warmer and warmer, and Paul just kind of kept going and kept going. And he not only nods off, but he falls into this deep sleep until all of a sudden, Paul, Eutychus, he just falls out that window three stories down. And you can imagine that congregation just absolutely horrified. You talk about breaking up the spirit of worship. They rush out of that home down to Eutychus and to their absolute horror. They find that Eutychus had not only fallen, but Eutychus had died in the fall. And what we read about is this amazing miracle in the fashion of Elijah and Elisha and, of course, Jesus himself and and. Paul, through the power and life of Jesus Christ, brings Eutychus back to life and revives them. And you know what that church does then? Well, nobody's tired now. So let's all just rush back in. We'll eat a little more. We'll visit a little more. Paul, you preach to us a little more. And they went all night until Paul had to leave in the morning. And I love the way that Kent Hughes points this out about this scripture 
you have to feel sorry for Eutychus. Because not only does he fall asleep on the apostle Paul, Luke was there with his pen (laughs) to record it. And the Holy Spirit of God sees fit to put it in Scripture. Now, think about this. I'm not accusing anybody in this room, but there have been millions of people throughout church history who have fallen asleep in sermons. I, I have had the privilege to preach for almost every week for almost 20 years, I've seen it. (laughs) I know that any given Sunday, it can happen. And yet, who do we think of when we think of someone falling asleep at church? We think of poor Eutychus. But a lot of times, people who come to church and then end up kind of nodding off in the message, they are just like Eutychus in that they show up because they're hungry for the Word of God. Eutychus had worked all day He's he's doing his best to keep his eyes open. He wants to be there. He wasn't going to miss the service no matter how tired that he was. And I always think what God does in bringing him back to life so that he can go back to hear the word. He honors Eutychus' desire to hear the word in there. And some of us are that way. Some of us have really trying work schedules. Some of us struggle with insomnia. Some of us might take medication. There's all kinds of reasons that we might be tired. But when we open ourselves up to the Word of God, when we make worship with the saints a priority, even when we're exhausted, God honors that. That's not the problem. The problem is when we struggle to hear the Word of God, even when we're not tired. The problem is is when we struggle to want the Word of God at all. And if you're a student here, you have the privilege of attending a university where all of your education is centered around the Word of God. And the danger of that, and I've been there, is that we begin to take it for granted. And we don't make hearing receiving and doing the word of God the priority that we should and the reason that this matters so much just think even of what we sang about is because the way that God communicates himself to us the way that God shows Jesus to us now is through his word it is a matter of eternal life how we make every effort to hear the word of God and then hearing to do it. And that's what our passage of scripture emphasizes this morning. So we're going to read together beginning in James chapter 1 verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at a natural face in a mirror, but once it's gone, he's looked at himself, he's gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this one will be blessed in what he does. And if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. God's will for you is salvation. That is his will for every single person. God made you for himself. God made you to know him and make him known. And every single one of us, we all go our own way. We all turn away from our created purpose. We, we sin. 
And yet God is so committed to us, for God so loves us that he sends his son Jesus Christ who lives a perfect life in our place so that he can credit his righteousness to us when we believe who goes all the way to the cross and dies for our sin so that he can forgive us, wiping away what we deserve and rises from the dead to defeat death on our behalf. And in that, we experience our purpose anew. We come to know God and we're able to make him known. And how does any of that happen? It happens through the word. It doesn't happen any other way way. We hear, we believe, we do. We are transformed, we grow in Christ through the ministry of the Word. James describes how this happens at the beginning of the book. If you read it, he talks about the trials of life. All the trials of life are are the normal things that every human being goes through, the ups and the downs. You're never going to experience just up after up after up. That's not the way that this life works. We're not only sinners, we live in a sin-cursed world. But as we know Christ and as we begin to grow into what we were made and saved to be and do, we're able to flourish as human beings. And throughout it all, we need the Word of God. And so if you're saved, if you're going through the trial of life, if you need wisdom, if you're resisting temptation, we need to hear, believe, and do the word. But as this passage points out, there are things that we have to do if we're going to hear, believe, and do the word. There's four things here that are listed. We have to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to be humble. And that's the problem. I mean, if you're anything like me, the problem is, is that in my own nature, I'm the exact opposite of every one of those things. Our natural reaction is not to be slow to, to speak and quick to listen. It's to be slow to listen and quick to speak. Consider how many conversations that you've ever had when you realize about halfway through that the other person's not listening to you at all. You can just see it in their eyes. They're thinking about what they're going to say. Or if we turn that around, think about how often you've done that to somebody else where you know somebody has just introduced themselves and told you who they are and where they're from. And if you, on just the pain of your life, had to repeat their name, you'd be gone. (laughs) Because we're so focused on ourselves. We're so consumed with what we want to say. To be quick to listen was so essential in James's day. We're talking about a day when they didn't have the written word of God. They couldn't just go to their room, go to their home, go to the library, go to the bookstore, go to their car, pull out their phone. They couldn't do any of those things. If they wanted the life-giving power of the word in their life, what did they have to do? They had to pay attention, make an effort, do it on purpose even amidst distraction. It's a matter of life and death. But I think sometimes, and again, the more saturated in this that we are, the more that we get used to the environment in which God has placed us where we're just consumed in the Word, the easier this is to do. That, well, I've got so much of the Word, of course it's just going to happen. And yet we have to pay just as much attention. We have to be just as purposeful. I love the song that we sang this morning. It was so appropriate because our prayer in this day and age, and particularly for where you are in life right now, has to be over and over and over, God, help me to be still and know that you are you, to hear you. I need to hear you. We are a world so easily distracted with every buzz, with every notification, with every like, with everything that we want to do, with everywhere that we want to be, with everywhere that we want to go, and we've somehow turned around the purpose of life to just be those things. How, many, how much will I get to travel? How much money will I get to make? How many people will know me, and and really, why do we want to be known? How many people will let me know how awesome I think I am? 
we need to slow down and be quick to hear the word. And that can only happen not only if we're slow to speak, but we're slow to anger. Those things work together, being slow to speak and slow to anger. Because why is it that sometimes we're so tempted to speak? We want to drown out what that other person is saying. We want to drown out the word of God. When God challenges us in his word and our first instinct is to kind of just bow up, and you know, I, I played football in high school, and believe it or not, I'm, I know I'm a little short, but I played offensive line. And I started, and it was funny. You'd go boom, 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 and I'd be right there. <laughs> but, but I'd stand there and just not move. Just not move. You just bow up. You just block it all. That's what we do to the Word. In our anger, we just we put our hands up. We we push back against it. I'm not going anywhere. And we get angry at those who would bring the word to us. And we disguise our disobedience with our anger. How dare you try to tell me that I have to live my life that way? How dare you try to tell me that I have to change? How dare you have to try to tell me that I need to make that sacrifice? As James reminds us here, our anger will never achieve the righteousness of God. There is certainly righteous anger. Angry people always make that excuse. Again, I'm not going to tell anyone in here, but if you're continuing, well, Jesus always got angry when at sin. He did in a very righteous way, and we should be angry at sin too. Unfortunately, our anger is typically self-righteous. It's typically prideful and self-serving. We get angry at God. We get angry at his ways. We get angry at his word. So what's the Bible say? We have to lay aside that filthiness and wickedness. Wow. Think of how God describes when we bow up at his word. Filthiness and wickedness? Because that's serious business. We need the word because we need Jesus. Our eternal life depends on it. And the reason that our eternal life depends on receiving the word is because if you never receive the word, you'll never do the word. And if you don't do the word, you're not a follower of Christ. And if you're not a follower of Christ, your heart has never been transformed by him. Love is not just a feeling. It is an action. Think of how God loves you. God made you. God saved you. God called you. God gifted you. God placed you. God redeemed you. God reconciled you. God does love. He is love and he does love. Love is an action. We have to put the word of God into practice if we have actually heard it. I mean, we would know this if we, we applied it to any other area of life. Think about if, if, you, if you've got a job and your boss comes to you and says, okay, I'm going to be gone for a month, but I'm putting you in charge. And I have taken the time to write out a very explicit list of what I want and how you should conduct yourselves and what this office should look like while I'm gone. He comes back in a month and nothing that I wrote down has happened. And what would it be if you looked at your boss and said, I read this several times. In fact, I got a group of other people in the office together and we talked through our favorite parts. And then we memorized them. And and some people over here are pretty gifted musically. They even wrote a song about this part of your instructions to us. But if you didn't do it, if it didn't make any actual difference, I'm telling you, you're not going to get very far in that conversation until you're out of a job. We, we know this. We recognize this. And yet, 
confronted with the inspired, inerrant word of God that God in his perfect, gracious providence has brought down to us and has made it possible for so many, with so many different languages and so many different places to hear of who he is. And we have this overabundance of the word and we're not swift to hear and do. The Bible says that's like looking in a mirror and forgetting what you've seen. It's the wicked witch thinking she's the fairest of them all. If you're oblivious to reality. What are we called to do? We're called to look intently, to make an effort into God's perfect law of liberty, the only law that will set you free. This has become so messed up in our world. We think freedom is the overthrowing of any commitment. We think th- freedom is the overthrow- overthrowing of any person, of, of any law, of anything that restricts me or says you have to do this or you're obligated to do this. And freedom, the only freedom that truly sets us free is knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior and submitting fully to him. And that's our experience as we look into the law of liberty. And so what should your goal be? My encouragement to you is always going to be to think in terms of next steps with God's word. Where am I now and what next step do I need to take? So it might be that I'm struggling with a consistent church attendance or struggling with even finding a church. After all, I'm going to a school where I get the word of God all the time. Why do I need to go to a church too? It might be that we need to focus on getting involved and consistent at a church that preaches the word. Might be that we're in a church, but when we show up, we're exhausted. And we're not exhausted because of Eutychus, because of other obligations. We're exhausted because we're doing anything else but preparing ourselves to hear the word. We need to make that a priority. It might be that we need to take that time in the morning and make that a habit. It might be that we need to take that time in the morning and the evening, but there is always a next step that you can take with God in his word. That is how we grow. And as this passage comes together here at the end, it tells us how we know that we've grown. So God God doesn't leave it up to chance. He doesn't leave it up to us to know whether or not that we're, we're going forward with him and his word and being transformed. That's the end of this passage. And at the end of verse 25, we are blessed when we follow the word of God. We are transformed. But then we find in verses 26 and 27 three tests. And these tests are more important than any test that if you take any of my classes, I would ever give you. These are the tests that when we stand before God, he's going to look at us and say, were you living this way or not? And he gives us three of them. He says, if you've been transformed by the word, what is true religion? And true religion in this context is what does a relationship with the Father in Christ by the Spirit look like? Looks like bridling your tongue. Well, we start to bow up at that one again. Well, wait, wait a second. Of all the things that God could have said about what true religion looks like, that's where he's going to start? With our tongues, with our words? But what does Jesus say? Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. The words that we say and the way that we say them are reflections of our hearts. James in chapter 3 will compare controlling the tongue to compare a a, a galloping horse, trying to rein a galloping horse in. And I'm going to tell you all right now, don't ever invite me horseback riding. I'm never going to go. And they've got a good reason. I was 12 years old, a family, we were horseback riding somewhere. And you know, they give the gentlest, oldest horses to the kids, to the inexperienced riders. And even despite that, my, my younger sister... 11 years old, that horse got spooked by something, we never knew what, threw her right off, right beside me. And I'm going to tell you what happened after that, and and she broke her ankle, but she was okay, but I got off that horse. We're not not going to do that anymore, because a horse is so easily spooked, even if it's been trained. 
how much more so our tongues, our words. If we're not constantly in the word and with Christ, our words are going to reflect a heart that has gone askew. Your words matter. That second test that we get to look at in our lives is ministering to widows and orphans. In other words, are we fulfilling Christ's greatest commandment? Not only to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, but to love our neighbors as ourselves, and especially our neighbors who are in greatest need. That's who the widows and orphans here are, those in greatest need in a world that needed their help. There's no government support for them back then. That was on the church. And we need to examine our own lives. If you are too busy to ever take time on purpose for someone in need, then you are too busy. You're missing what Jesus has called you to do. All of us need to be, we're called to be that person to someone else in our lives. So again, think about what's that next step I need to take to make sure that I'm ministering to someone in need. And then that last one, to be unstained by the world. Go, what is that? Pursue holiness. Be like Jesus. Watch what you consume. Watch, watch what you watch. Pay attention to it. That's not legalism. That's sanctification. That's growing in Christ. And that's what the Word leads us to. How do we know what it is to be like the world or to be like Christ? How do we know and how are we moved to minister to those in need? How is our tongue controlled? The more time that we spend with God as we build a relationship with Him on His Word. And all three of those things are only tests that you will pass when you are in the Word of God. Which is why all of us can look to Eutychus who did all that he could, even after he fell out of a window, to rush back in to hear the word of God again. And take note of how God blessed Eutychus with new life to hear the word again. It is never too late to start over with where you are with God in his word. God will always move you forward there. So may God give us hearts for his word that we would have hearts for his son. Please pray with me. Father, let us never take your word for granted. Pray for all my brothers and sisters in here. It is, it is all too easy in ourselves to take the sacred and holy for granted, to get used to knowing you, to making you known. May we never do that. Open up our hearts again. Revive our hearts again for your word. Help us to take that next step with you. We ask all of this, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.